you you need to like really seriously constrain the kinds of professional decisions that the police are making uh, to avoid the kind of worry that you're talking about. But the separate thing I'll say is that, uh, and I think this is maybe a little bit more controversial, uh, part of this requires thinking of the police as a genuine profession uh, who make judgments uh, that, you know, it requires some expert knowledge uh, to evaluate. And I think that like the police profession is really only like halfway there, right? They've got like uh, the, the tools and the technology and the, the uniforms and stuff like that, but they don't have the internal systems of accountability that other professions tend to have, right? Like, Welcome to Freedom, a show about ideas that matter. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Ross Powell. Today's episode features Jake Monahan, an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. His new book is Just Policing. We discuss the philosophical nuances around the police. Many people now talk about abolishing the police, but is that even possible or desirable? And if we need police, how do we make them better? But before that, we'd like to remind you that Freedom is a listener-supported show. If you like what you hear, please consider becoming a supporter. Learn more at www.support.freedom.audio. There has, of course, been a lot of discussion of policing, especially in the last couple of years. And I guess the interesting first question, which I never thought I would hear discussed in my lifetime, I mean, libertarians like to discuss it, but should we even have police? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, right? Um, the the sort of question is like a, a common one for libertarian theorists or for anarchists. Um, and uh, then like all of a sudden, right? Boom, like everyone's an abolitionist or it's at least super popular. And like all of a sudden, you know, this question is at like the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, and so, I mean, like, okay, right. I'm a philosopher. So unsurprisingly, I'm like one way to sort of approach this is by thinking about like, okay, what do we mean by the police? Uh, and I think that making some basic distinctions here, uh, can sort of help us, you know, answer this question, right? So do we need the police? Well, we should distinguish between the police sort of function, uh, the sort of stuff that we have police do and the police institution, uh, the sort of like manifestation that we currently have of policing. And I think once you draw that kind of distinction, it becomes clear that most of the complaints that we have or about the current institutional manifestation we have rather than the function of police. Uh, and I think that this is really clear when you look at the sort of abolitionist critiques of policing, right? Uh, there isn't a complaint about like an overly invasive state or like inappropriate kinds of social control, right? Uh, there's just complaints, like substantive complaints about what the police are doing, uh, the sort of historical roots, right? Uh, and so, I think that um, there's actually quite a bit of agreement that lots of what the police do uh, is illegitimate. Uh, we could do without it, right? The world would be better off without it. Uh, but I think once you draw those distinctions, right, the the kind of question uh, that we're engaging here becomes like very different than the sort of like popular discussion, uh, if that makes sense. Is that almost a distinction without a difference though, because if we can say, look, my concern isn't all of this interventionist stuff that the state does, all the laws on the books, everything that police are asked to enforce, but rather kind of the way they're going about it. And so if we just switched it from police to a whole bunch of different it's, you know, mental health counselors and crisis teams and whatever else that, you know, we might come up with in addition to you know, kind of walking the beat policing, then things would be better without changing the underlying tasks that they've been tasked with carrying out. But it seems like any any time you ask people to carry out the quantity of tasks, the intrusiveness of the tasks, and grant the power that we we grant the government in the kinds of things that we currently group under the term policing, when you just kind of inevitably get all of the bad stuff, now it's just dispersed across a larger range of, 
of institutions in the same way that, you know, we could, we could concentrate, we could like change the organizations that make up the federal government, but the federal government would still do lots of bad things because it's tasked with doing lots of bad things. Yeah. So that, that's exactly right. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's a distinction without a difference, but I think that the point that you're making is exactly right. So once you draw this distinction between the institution and the function, and you see that a lot of abolitionists are complaining about the institution and not the function, then we recognize that like, okay, the real questions about just policing are about the function, right? What are we going to have them do? And I think unfortunately, like the past couple of years of like public discourse about the police has been focused not on those questions, right? They've been following the lead of the abolitionist and sort of complaining about the institution. Uh, and so the point that you're making is that like we can sort of unbundle the police, right? We can replace them with volunteer community patrols, right? You know, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can change our institution. And it's really likely that we're going to get uh, unjust policing. And so like, I think a really easy example of this uh, is uh, you can see it in uh, a bunch of different cities through the, the history of kind of social responses to sex work. Uh, so you get this thing uh, that people have called positive loitering, uh, where like a bunch of people in a church group or something like that will go hang out on like the active sex work corner or something like that and just disrupt business, right? And like, we're going to be here so that you can't use this public space in the way that you want to. So, right, this is not a public police uh, institution, but it's clearly a, a function of social control, right? Uh, you have a group of people claiming a kind of social control. And so, I mean, one, like, one way of using this distinction is to say to the abolitionists, like, you're not actually as radical as you think that you are, right? You just want to kind of remake policing along some other lines. And in the lines that you want to pursue are going to be naturally as contentious as the kind of things that we're doing now, right? Uh, and I think this is actually really important. So like you, you raise the point about like, well, we can just sort of uh, peel functions off, uh, give them to like mental health workers or something, like that, right? Uh, there's this really optimistic view that if we sort of distinguish this kind of like left hand and right hand of the state, the like helping and healing versus the punitive function, uh, that like somehow things will be better. But like we know that like the helping and healing functions can be sort of, you know, massive sources of injustice, right? Like this is a thing that we know quite well. And so, so I guess I'm kind of ranting at this point and maybe I'll, I'll stop and turn it back over to you, but like this push to medicalize a lot of things uh, is I think well taken in some respects, but in others, you know, uh, we should be aware of the fact that there's, you know, inbuilt risk to all of these forms of social control. And I think that, that pointing out that distinction uh, helps us see that and pushes back against some of the, I think, mistakes that have crept into the discourse because we've been following the lead of the abolitionists. There's obviously a paradox if you're a liberal and someone who believes in democracy. So we could start, as Aaron's question said, we, we should start with the laws. Like if the laws are unjust, then all forms of policing of those laws is unjust. I think that that... I think everyone would actually agree with that. They just they would have different disagreements about what a just or unjust law is. But then we sure. have to go to this level of discretion, which I, I think is really great that your book talks about, and it's an unexplored part of legal philosophy too, with say judges, where how much legitimate discretion exists. So assume a just law, whatever your definition of a just law is. But then is it okay for police, if they're policing a just law, to decide not to enforce it, for example? And is that a destruction of the rule of law, Some, you know, a cornerstone of Western liberal tradition? If a cop has been told to enforce a law and he doesn't enforce a law, he or she doesn't enforce a law, is that is that something we should be against? Yeah, this is a really important question, and I take it to be one of the sort of most central or most essential uh, questions about just policing. Um, and it's a really difficult one, right? As you say, there's this tension between our democratic commitments and our liberal commitments, at least if you have them. Uh, we like these sort of, it, it, I should take a step back and say it doesn't even have to necessarily be democratic, right? It could just be merely procedural. Right. If you're sort of like an anarcho-capitalist and you imagine that we've replaced the state and like, well, you've got like an HOA making rules or I don't know, something like that. Right. Like there are these procedural 
issues that often come in tension with the substantive ones. Normally, the procedure is democratic, but it but it need not be right. So, what do we do in cases like this where they where they come apart? Right. Well, certain uh, theorists, right. I think sort of famously, Hayek uh, has suggested uh, that. Actually, paradoxically, if we just keep enforcing the laws that we think are substantively unjust, uh, we will hasten their removal from the books, right? And so, yeah, okay, everyone says if the law is unjust, right, and you enforce it, that's going to be unjust. But like, what about this issue of trying to strategically not enforce the unjust things, right? Well, okay, you have this puzzle or this paradox that maybe the, the right thing to do is actually enforce the unjust law because then you'll, then you'll remove it from the books, right? And then you have the separate question uh, that has to do with like whether you're just disregarding the uh, the democratic values or the procedural values, right? Take uh, you know separate the prediction about what happens from enforcing the unjust laws, right? Maybe you should just do that anyway, right? Because I don't know, dem democracy sort of like cleanses your actions or you know whatever story you want to tell. Is it permissible for law enforcers uh, to decline to enforce what we take to be an unjust law? So I think these are the two like kind of fundamental questions when we're thinking about democracy. Uh, and so I, I have quite a bit to say about this. Like the a lot of the book is sort of aimed at kind of fleshing out these sorts of things. Uh, and so a couple of basic points I guess I'll make. Uh, one, I think that this kind of Hayekian view, it's not just Hayek, right? It's this uh, a view in the book I refer to as legalism uh, that says that like just policing is the inf uh, impartial enforcement of law. I think that is really tempting when you're doing what political philosophers call ideal theory. We're imagining that the institutions work roughly as we expect them to. People are you know, reasonably well motivated, et cetera, et cetera. On this ideal model, the state is sort of articulated. We have uh, the decision-making part, uh, and then we have like the that that leads to the rulemaking, and then we have the enforcement, right? And we need to just separate these things. I think that uh, this is like an inappropriate picture of how the law works uh, because, well, for a bunch of reasons, but like one is uh, a, a point familiar in legal philosophy. We have this issue of interpretation, right? This is the, the issue of discretion that the legal philosophers have been focused on mostly. We have to interpret the law. Uh, and there is no set of rules that's so perfect that it doesn't require interpretation. So this is one point. It's a familiar one. The other issue I think that makes policing a little bit more complicated than the issues facing the judges uh, is they also have resource scarcity, right? There are only so many laws that they can enforce at a particular time. They just have to make these decisions. So once you think about law and law enforcement looking like that, then I think that the question about discretion looks like ill-formed. Uh, it's like, it's a little odd, right, to ask whether discretion is appropriate if it's just the normal state of affairs, right? And so then that makes the question, uh, how should the police exercise their discretion? And so whereas the legalists might have thought that, uh, you know, just policing is largely a matter of the impartial enforcement of law, I actually think that, like, noticing the way that policing works sort of flips the question. And kind of every everyone, no matter your theoretical commitments, is largely left without a way to account for, you know, good and bad, uh, just and unjust policing. Because I think that you can't just look at the rules. I'm going to take a step back, actually, as some of our listeners might be wondering this, because I think it might be important to get into the, the empirics that you do in your book, not a ton, it's a book of philosophy, but I think a lot of people believe that police just don't work. Like that, that, that they don't lower crime. There's been a bunch of papers about that, that police, I mean, obviously there's the complaints about them from different ideological standpoints, but I also think that they think that police don't really do anything good for society. Uh, what, do, what do we know yeah. about that in so far as we know anything about it? Yeah, this is a really difficult, really tricky empirical question. Um, so... One thing to say is that uh, the there was this initial wave of empirical research on the effectiveness of police. It happened a few decades ago, uh, like the Kansas City Preventative Patrol Experiment. There was uh, you know a big one in Newark, 
there's a sort of early wave of empirical police research and the results were like not encouraging, right? They were like, hey, it looks like basically no matter what we do, uh, we're not really effective in reducing crime, right? You can add more police to the streets and it looks like not a whole lot happens, right? You just sort of like, let's list the cities and their crime rates and then the police per capita and hey, look, there's no relationship. And so for a little while, uh, there was this kind of consensus that the police are relatively ineffective. Uh, David Bailey uh, summarized this in this, uh, I think, now maybe famous book as a result of the abolitionists, right? This view that the police keep us safe is a myth. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that the abolitionists have seized on. Um, so, all right, a couple of things to say. One, uh, we've just gotten better at social science. Uh, and I think that a lot of these experiments uh, have, we've gone back to them and we found more promising results. That in fact, like when we get better at measuring, we do find that like putting a patrol officer on a corner will reduce certain kinds of crime, right? Uh, adding a homicide detective does reduce, you know, a certain number of homicides. Uh, so we've found, uh, I think, evidence for marginal deterrence from policing. Uh, and so I think that it's pretty empirically safe to say that the police do reduce certain crimes. They, you know, they change the nature of the activity that people engage in. Like, of course they do, right? Like, they have to because, you know, our, like rational choice theories of behavior just suggest like there's going to be an effect. Is it worth the cost? Well, that's a different and I think better question. Uh, but I think that it is clear that police do influence behavior, right? There is some deterrence. Um, yeah, I think that's clear. I'm assuming that that data comes out of marginal differences in the quantity of policing and the quantity of crime, because you're not going to run a test where you say, okay, we're going to take the city of Minneapolis and we're going to pull all of the police out of it and see what yeah. happens. And, and so that, but that seems like just categorically a different kind of experiment than if we increase the police force by 10% or lower it by 10%, what happens to crime? Just like if we said, what we're going to do is turn every third citizen into a cop with a gun and have them report on each other. Like we're going to set up, you know, East Berlin or something and then right. measure rates. Like that's, that's no longer kind of a spectrum. It's just a qualitatively different situation. And so how much can we take the kind of studies that you've just talked about and think about them in the context of the genuine like abolition and distribution to non-policing that a lot of people tend to call for? Excellent question. So, um, Lots of the debate so far has been, uh, I think, confused. You said the empirics are largely about marginal differences, right? What does the one extra police officer do? Uh, and people have sort of taken this uh, and drawn sort of absolute conclusions, right? Do police deter or not? Uh, and I think that basically, like, there's nothing in the empirical work that we've seen that can tell us with any degree of, like, reliability what would happen if you just, like, got rid of the police department, right? Like... LAPD is gone tomorrow. What happens? Uh, who knows? Uh, I'm not sure. One way that you can try and get at this question uh, is by looking at forms of social control in prisons uh, or forms of social control in uh, sort of like developing democracies, right? So it's two very different kinds of state power. Uh, in prison, you would think the state is absolute. In these developing democracies, right, it's really weak. Uh, yet in both cases, you get forms of social control, right? Uh, and so I think that actually, uh, if we go back to this distinction uh, that we drew at the beginning between the sort of function and the institution, what you see is the function is durable, right? People are going to fill that function. Uh, and so, okay, we get rid of the LAPD, what happens? Well, it's not, you know, an abolitionist utopia uh, because, you know, people will sort of fill the void. Uh, and in a lot of cases, that's what the abolitionist wants, right? Like they want alternatives. Uh, and I think that uh, the alternatives that they want, uh, there's actually uh, some valuable evidence here, right? So uh, you can take uh, the police sort of off the street uh, or, or you can take that police function 
uh, and you can fill it with like volunteers, right? So they do this in Chicago in some cases, the I think Safe Passage program, where they put basically glorified crossing guards uh, on popular, uh, you know, pedestrian commutes home from school, right? And what they so so there's been some uh, some social science on this. What the economists who have looked at it have found is that there is actually a deterrence effect. Uh, there's a little bit of a displacement effect, right? Some of the crime goes to other blocks. But, uh, you know, this is like an abolitionist success story in a way, I think, right? Like this is a non-police alternative to maintaining social control, to protecting the kids. Uh, but what are they doing? They're doing the same thing the police are doing. Uh, so, right, to sort of like wrap up the answer, like the empirical work that we have on uh, police efficacy, I think, won't tell us a whole lot about what happens if we actually just, you know, get rid of an entire police department tomorrow. But I think if we look at alternative forms of social control, uh, we can make some reasonable guesses about uh, the kinds of alternatives that we're likely to get in their, in their place. If we're doing not an ideal theory, uh, as your book uh, definitely is in that camp, uh, is it possible within a realm of non-ideal theory, if we took even a hard libertarian anarchist critique of police or even a, a hard leftist critique of police, that what will inevitably happen if you have such a force of people in power to do this to people is it will be used by the powerful for their own ends. So we, what we see in American policing, for example, over enforcement of the drug war, uh, civil forfeiture, making money off the drug war, that, that we should actually just accept this as inevitable as long as we have the institutions, the non-ideal institutions that we have. And that actually that, makes a good case for abolition in the abstract. It doesn't explain exactly what institution should replace it, um, but we should expect it. I, I always tell students, I say, what the government does when it supplies something is it either oversupplies it or undersupplies it. That's true of, you know, I live in Northern Virginia. There's state-run liquor stores. Uh, I'm sorry. They're, they're, they're nowhere. You can't find, you know, they're, 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 you know, in Colorado, where here it is, there's a liquor store in every strip mall here. They don't know how many liquor stores there should be. But the same problem exists for law enforcement. They oversupply policing in Anacostia and they undersupply it in other areas that people care about. And we should just say that that's going to happen as long as the state is doing this. Yeah, I mean, I am really pessimistic about uh, so forms of social control, like one of the uh, main uh, claims in the book is that policing is inevitable um, for the reasons that I was just suggesting. Uh, but yeah, you know, analysis is inevitable. Uh, people responding uh, according to their incentives uh, or like according to their ideals that are often going to be misguided, right? Like lots of people have this intense sort of desire to just like control the way that other people live. Uh, and so you replace our current police institutions uh, with other institutional forms of providing the, you know, the police role. Some of them might be intentional, but as I've suggested, some of them won't be intentional. Uh, you are going to get, I think, some deep injustices as a result of not ideal forms of social control. So, like, what do you do about that? Uh, well, if you're doing ideal theory, it's like, well, the police should just defer to the legislature. But like, we, you know, just suggested like, hey, maybe that's not a great idea for a whole bunch of reasons. I go over some others in the book. Uh, well, we should then, right, think that not only is a theory of just policing largely concerned with uh, the just exercise of police discretion, uh, we should probably orient our theory in this kind of defensive way. And so that's one of the things that I try to do uh, in the book with this idea of the legitimacy risk framework. Uh, where there are just like a bunch of normative attributes that we associate with policing or they characterize various kinds of policing and they interact, they can amplify one another. Uh, and that means that like, even if you are like a, right, a hardcore drug warrior or like, you know, you really think that like sex work is terrible and it needs to be criminalized for, you know, reasons that I suggest, that's a really, really high risk form of social control uh, and I think that you should not be tempted by it, right? You should you should try to fight fight those urges. Um, and you know, more relevantly for like the police officer or administrator, they should be seeking out low legitimacy risk forms of policing. So like the idea being that like so social control is here to stay. It's super duper high risk. Uh, 
our theory of just social control or policing needs to be oriented uh, in, in light of that. Can you unpack a bit more what you mean by legitimacy risks? Like if let's say that you you do the opposite of what you just advised, like what is what is the outcome? What does the delegitimization look like? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really concerned about in the book is the um, problems of complexity and coupling and social systems. So like one of the really serious problems with the American criminal legal system is that uh, it's fallible uh, and it interacts in really bad ways with a whole bunch of other social systems, right? Uh, you know, you can lose your voting rights, you can lose your welfare, right? Lose custody of your kids, uh, in addition to like all of the really obvious costs. Uh, so I think that what we should be doing is like paying a lot of attention to this issue of coupling. Uh, and you, you get the sort of institutional coupling that I'm just talking about, but you also get a coupling between uh, characteristics of policing. So uh, here's an example. Uh, drug policing uh, is almost always proactive rather than reactive, right? For obvious reasons, familiar reasons, right? The drug sellers and the drug takers, they don't want to be bothered. They're not calling the cops. So if the police are going to find the, you know, catch the people, the bad guys with the drugs, it will have to be proactive. Um, this is also a uh, kind of policing that is extremely contentious. So the goal here has a uh, low authorization uh, to use some terminology from the book. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that we should decriminalize drug use, right? We should take a more gentle approach to it. And so you have a proactive and low authorization form of policing uh, that also carries with it really high burdens, right? You're not going to catch lots of the drug dealers. How do you, you know, you put your rational choice theory hat on. How do you make it so the drug dealers stop? You punish them severely, right? So the burden goes up. And so we're sort of coupling the policing with the punishment system. And we're also joining these uh, normative characteristics that I think make the policing extremely high risk, right? So this is likely to be un unauthorized because it's proactive. No one asks them to do it. It's doubly likely to be unauthorized because it has low democratic authorization, uh, or if you want to be a liberal about it, right? Like there's substantive reasons for skepticism here and the burdens are enormous. And so maybe the drug warriors are right, but they're, they're probably not. And in light of the fact that they might not be, you know, they, I think they don't have the justification uh, to engage in this really high form of this high risk form of policing, right? So what happens if we go in the other direction? You know, well, you just imagine like, I think the, the logical end point of that is like uh, the police state where just everything is sort of coupled, right? Like don't hang out with Vladimir Putin and annoy him and then stand near a window. All of this is ultimately bound up in questions of justice and what justice entails because the police we think of as being the ones who enforce justice, maintain a system of justice, and so on. And all three of us have studied philosophy. And if there's one thing that's clear from a study of philosophy, it is that we've spent thousands of years trying to figure out what justice is. And um, I'll just say it it remains unclear. <laughs> no, I figured uh, it out. <laughs> and, and it seems like a big problem with policing is that there are two fundamentally different conceptions of justice that command a lot of allegiance within at least Western and American culture. One is what we might call like a liberal conception, which is roughly, you know, we're going to, we're going to protect people's rights, their property. We're going to let them, you know, we're going to stop the things that are interfering with their ability to live their lives as they see fit and so on. And so the police do should do that kind of stuff, investigate thefts and assaults and murders and make sure that there isn't petty crime, et cetera. But the other one that is quite popular is that justice is a society that's organized in a certain way. You know, this is, I, I've been reading a lot of conservative writers from the time of the civil rights movement, like National Review types and so on. And it's striking how much they 
basically see the civil rights movement and the idea that minorities and women and so on should have kind of equal moral worth and and social power to white men as like a threat to the fundamental justice of society, that it's it will tear apart the foundations of everything that matters. These hierarchies are natural, and so therefore it's unjust to try to undo them and so on. And and that is just this really powerful conception of justice that still is with us. You know, it's it shows up explicitly among a liberal writers today, like, you know, self-identified liberal writers, but also it it shows up in your standard kind of suburban normie who says they're in favor of police reform, but then as soon as they start seeing some people marching in the streets, they're like, oh no, we need to crack down. We can't have that. Uh, and and those are just fundamentally incompatible. And it seems like the police, the police can't do both. Um, and and the police themselves seem to embrace the the culture of policing seems to lean more towards the like maintenance of hierarchies and the status quo and so on and it tends to attract the people so how do we how do we even really talk about these issues and the discretion that police should have what they should enforce how they should be structured when there's just these two what feel like incommensurable like at each other's throats conceptions of what it even means to have a just society yeah i mean this is the like one of the deep problems in political philosophy uh and it arises, uh, you know, in this like really pressing way for the police, right? As you just suggested. So, I mean, I think that like one thing to do uh, is approach the issue theoretically from this non-ideal way, uh, because that lets you recognize that like this tension is there; it's not going away, and also like the substantive aims that people have for policing, right? The sort of like maintenance of hierarchy things you were just suggesting, uh, like we disagree about them, right? So, like, you know, you could you could be an ideal theorist; you could do the kind of like John Rawls thing where you engage in this normalizing project and you imagine away the disagreement, and then I think you've largely imagined away like the like the really actual pressing problems uh, that, that give rise to the need for social control in the police. Okay, so like you shouldn't do that, right? Uh, but then you're just confronted with this tension. Like I, I just think that there's uh, no like solving the tension, but there's ways of trying to ameliorate it. So one is the non-ideal theoretical approach. Uh, another is looking at uh, ways to uh, un unbundle the police uh, so that we can find areas of convergence. Uh, so like even if you are one of these illiberals on, on the right or the left uh, and you think that like the police should be, you know, organizing society according to your vision, uh, part of that vision is likely going to include like the basics of policing. So like stop assaults you know, prevent murders, like there's the sort of core that we, most of us agree on. And so like a lot of different tradition, like approaches in the liberal tradition, like one of my aims here is to find these areas of convergence uh, that we can say, all right, like policing is going to be justified in these ways. And then the areas that we don't converge on, well, either like, you know, we just haven't met the burden uh, for enforcement. And so you maybe will be unhappy, but the police shouldn't do anything. Or in other cases, I think that we can solve these problems with like sort of, you know, there are polycentric solutions, right? Uh, so when you go to one, you know, concert venue over another, right? Like, well, you're allowed to mosh at this one, but not that one, right? You're opting into a conception of order. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of sort of social and institutional tools to do some of these problems in that way. Uh, but then like, okay, like, I think that this is an important conclusion, right? Like one of the important parts of getting just policing right is uh, forming the institution such that it's like, you know, you're channeling the various functions in the right way. Right? So like, just to, to, to clarify that, like one function is the basic deterrence patrol function. Another function is like the vice patrol. We can separate these uh, and we can all agree that like, you know, there's something at least attractive about the kind of ordinary deterrence patrol. 
uh, and I think I'll find no disagreement here anyway, that like there's something deeply objectionable about the vice patrol, right? Uh, and I think that I take myself to have given you some sort of more like theory neutral arguments for why the vice patrol is uh, is 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 a is bad news, right? Uh, apart from the substantive values, I'm not actually sure if that addressed your question, but well, I, I, dovetailing off that, does this? I mean, we've talked about discretion. Do we need a really robust theory of discretion that a uh, you know individual officer walking the beat can use? Because you know, if you have moral commitments about just laws, then even corruption may not always be wrong. Like I think drug laws are fundamentally immoral. And so if a cop takes $50 from someone to not arrest them for a drug violation, um, maybe that's one theory of discretion where it's like, well, now it's corruption. But if we think about a police state, as you admit, like, a, you know, whether it's North Korea today, like I would probably like more corruption there where people can avoid the the foot of the state on their neck by even just paying someone off. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so it just seems like ultimately we need like a very robust theory of discretion that I couldn't expect any police officer to really, there's, they're not philosophers. We're not employing philosophers to walk the beat. So how do we give them a theory of discretion that doesn't require them to read your book and take a bunch of classes that they can do their job in an effective way. Right. Yeah, that's good. I mean, so what you don't want to use some sort of jargon is you don't want, you don't want a theory on which like the police have to be like the Dworkinian interpreter, right? Where every time they do something, they're engaged in some really deep, you know, political philosophy. Um, so if I were suggesting uh, like a really sort of comprehensive, complete, uh, substantive conception of what society should be like, and then saying that the police should exercise their discretion to achieve that, then I think I would be on the hook for giving you like a really substantive sort of fully fledged theory of how police should exercise their discretion. Uh, but if you like the kind of like defensive orientation, uh, theoretical orientation that I've been advocating, I think that that makes your job a little bit easier, right? Uh, and there are certain principles that I think most police officers, if you read ethnographies, are already comfortable sort of reasoning about um, and, and in fact already play a role in their decision making uh, that uh, appropriately guide their discretion. And so there's the sort of philosophical or theoretical question about like when an exercise of discretion is permissible or not. And I want to suggest that, you know, it's permissible when it like appropriately minimizes legitimacy risks and so on and so forth. But then there's the kind of like functional empirical stuff about like how do you get the cops to behave in the way that you want them to, right? Turns out like that's a question as old as the police themselves, right? So like it used to be that the, the worry was like the night watchman was like drunk and asleep. And now we're worried about them like scrolling their phones or like, you know, you know doing some really like, racist, terrible beat down or something. Okay. So like one of the principles is this idea of proportionality. Uh, you should only, uh, exercise police power, right? If it's, if the benefits are worth the costs. Right. And so like you see traffic officers do this all the time. They're like, I'm not pulling that person over because I'd have to do a U-turn. It's just not worth it. Right. When you read the ethnographies of police officers and like skid rows or vice districts or something like that, they're regularly engaging in this kind of discretionary policing, right? It's just, it's not worth it to arrest this person who has a very small amount of crack cocaine because I'll be off the street for the next two hours and the murder rate here is really high, right? So some of the, the philosophical work is to su suggest that's not a problem. That's uh, actually like just legitimate policing, right? But then when you want to think about like, how do you actually inculcate these kind of attitudes, then you have to go about kind of like re-engineering the institution. Uh, and so I think the federal government is actually a model here in some respect, right? Like the law enforcement there is really specialized, uh, whereas at the state level, there's not a whole lot of specialization. It's just like a city police department. Um, and that poses some real problems, right? Like if you're a patrol officer, how do you get a promotion. You show that you'd be a good detective. How do you show that you'd be a good detective? You pull off a make a difference bust, right? And so now you've got your patrol officers trying to make big busts rather than do the, the more social work, uh, social worker kind of stuff, you know? Uh, and so 
I think that uh, splitting the law enforcement from the patrol functions of our local police departments would go a long way to changing the selection and treatment effects of officers. Uh, and that kind of gets you some of the positive discretionary policing like for free, right? It's not for free, but you're sort of like setting up the institution and like trying to inculcate a particular culture. Uh, there are real risks, right? Like immigration customs enforcement in the federal government. You're only joining that if you are like, I want to deploy buoys with razors. And that's terrifying, right? Uh, but at the very least, we have a political handle on this. We can defund them, and take away their razor buoys. Whether or not we do that is a separate question, but it's a lot harder when you don't have the specialization to do that. This is good because it, it brings up a distinction that I was curious about back at the beginning of our conversation when you mentioned that it's not really a question of whether there should be discretion or not because there already is because they're resource constrained. And and I think this gets to that, like how do we inculcate this, the right kind of view of discretion? Because I'm worried that there is a difference between telling a police officer, look, there's a lot of laws that you could be enforcing at any given time. You do not have the the time or the resources to enforce all of them. And so you have to, on the fly, pick and choose between them where you're going to focus your time. So, so pick from this set of kind of concrete options. And that's how discretion works. But if you instead are telling them, look, you should be having kind of these principles of you, you should, as opposed to basically making judgments about a there's the, the quantity is too great, you have to narrow it somehow. But now we're going to ask you to make or even frame your thinking in terms of qualitative judgments about what it is that you're doing and trying to accomplish. That seems that seems very different. You know, in, in the same way that like if I tell my kids, look, you can you can't eat all of the stuff we have in the house for dinner. So you have to pick from among this slate of options versus <laughs> why don't you think about like what it is that you think is a delicious dinner? They're going to eat a lot more healthy with the former choice set. And so is that do we kind of introduce a different kind of discretion that then potentially – I worry would exacerbate a lot of the cultural pathology because now they're starting to think about, oh, how am I going to make the world what I want it to be, which might not be the world that any of the rest of us want. Yeah. So this is like, this is really interesting. So uh, there's this famous, uh, I mean, I don't know, like famous in like police scholarship circles, uh, uh, scholar Herman Goldstein uh, his sort of claim to fame is this like problem oriented policing thing. He's like, you're not just enforcing the law, right? Like think about the problem that you're solving and then use the law as a tool. Right. And of course this is, you know, congenial to the way that I'm thinking about things, uh, reframes the, the look, uh, the way, the way that we have to look at police discretion. You read this essay where he's like, this is like a deep affront to police chiefs, right? If you talk to police chiefs about their discretion, like you will offend them because, you are suggesting that they have all of this political power uh, and they don't like that, right? Like they're legalists defensively. Hey, I'm, I'm just enforcing the law. I don't make the law, right? Take it up with, with uh, you know, city council or the legislature or whatever. Uh, so again, I think the response here is like the way that things are set up now, uh, we constrain the kind of discretion that police engage in uh, but maybe uh, in a less sort of deliberate way than we could, right? So you're definitely right if you just put an officer on the street and you say, here's the criminal code uh, and here are some of Jake's principles, you know, use them wisely. The result would be disastrous. Uh, so the, the way that you, I think, channel all this uh, is by thinking about uh, the kinds of policing uh, that various officers are engaged in. Uh, using the legitimacy risk profile or, or something like it, right? You think about like the, the qualitative nature of the policing uh, and you separate the institutions uh, and that lets you do a couple of things, right? So the rules are more specific. I think that we should still be giving officers rules. Like it's not, uh, I'm just, you know, rules aren't going to fix everything, but like there still needs to be the general orders, right? Like 
you're not allowed to pursue. You have to, you know, issue a verbal warning before you pull the trigger or like, you know, you have to, as soon as you put the cuffs on someone, you have to sit them up, right? Like we still want rules to prevent some kind of misbehavior. Uh, but we also want more uh, sort of like normatively sort of like value aligned, uh, like productivity expectations. Uh, the product productivity expectations are there in policing just as much as they are in other places, right? Like people argue about whether there are like quotas. It's like, that's just a red herring, right? There may not be like a, you have to give out 12 tickets quota, but if you don't give out 12 tickets, you know, the, the sergeant's going to give you a hard time, right? So the other, the other tool that we have uh, are like departmental awards. Uh, and so, you know, you see things like you get an award for like being brave, you know, uh, being involved in a, in a shooting or something like that. But like, we don't reward people for like passing someone on to the relevant social service provider or for like diffusing a situation. And so I think that um, you you need to like really seriously constrain the kinds of professional decisions that the police are making um, to avoid the kind of worry that you're talking about. But the separate thing I'll say is that, uh, and I think this is maybe a little bit more controversial, uh, part of this requires thinking of the police as a genuine profession uh, who make judgments uh, that, you know, it requires some expert knowledge uh, to evaluate. And I think that like the police profession is really only like halfway there, right? They've got like uh, the, the tools and the technology and the, the uniforms and stuff like that, but they don't have the internal systems of accountability that other professions tend to have, right? Like uh, I'm, you know, I'm not like overly optimistic about the nature of like law and medicine right now, uh, but there are at least these internal accountability mechanisms. And so once you recognize that so much of policing is highly discretionary, uh, you then I think have to change the way you think not only about the institutions, but about the professional nature of the role. And again, right, like this is all super duper high risk. I'm under no illusions that like we're going to solve the problem. You know, I think that like minimizing uh the police role is good because of that well that's sort of a for like to summarize because that kind of would summarize your book in the most absolutely terse way is it's very messy and complicated uh it, that what we can do there are some things we should accept like the need for social control and how that will come mm -hmm. um there are no easy answers but we have to think institutionally about incentives and, and what's going on i mean is that like a fair characterization like it's not jake fix policing uh you know right. in 200 pages it's uh yeah, that, yeah. that people need to think more realistically about this stuff than they have been right yeah absolutely and i mean to put it in maybe some technical terms like a lot of the conclusions that people reach in this area are sensitive to their modeling choices uh so like how do you think of like, what, what is the nature of this informal social model that you're reasoning about, right? Do you imagine this like perfectly articulated model of governance where the legislature is like really effective and, you know, so on and so forth? Well, okay, then maybe you want the police to be really deferential, right? Um, but that conclusion is a result of a modeling choice. Uh, and I think when we get the model right, um, a lot of the conclusions that I like kind of like fall out of that, right? So, um, there is no getting rid of social control. There's only like choosing what it's going to look like. Uh, there's no determining social control fully with a set of rules. It's always going to be discretionary. Uh, and we'll often be surprised at the, the kind of result. Uh, and so the theorists who think that like we know fully what justice is and we just need to kind of like achieve justice and then all the other things will be fixed, you know, I, that's way overly optimistic, right? Um, and likewise, underlying a lot of thinking about this is the sort of distinction between the left hand and the right hand of the state, as I mentioned earlier, sort of helping and healing versus like punitive or controlling. I don't think that distinction holds a whole lot of water, right? I mean, or if it does, it's a result of some modeling choice that you've made. Uh, so when you think about what how the world actually works, uh, I think that, you know, our conclusions about just policing, what, what just policing looks like, how we get there institutionally, are a lot different than people have recognized. Thank you for joining us on Freedom. This is a listener-supported show. 
If you'd like to get access to episode transcripts, bonus content, extended conversations, and our Discord community, go to www.freedom.audio.